program, clinical psychologist Lisa Bweski. She's back with me. And one of the pet lovers you just saw, Danielle Tarantola, whose dog Trouble was everything to her. We heard her talking about it there. Her clone pet, there he is, Double Trouble, is here tonight. All right, Danielle, just how big a presence in your life was Trouble? Oh, very, very, very big. I mean, he was with me through most of my adult life, like from, from when I was 18 till about 36, which basically is a big, important time in your life. Is he, was he, I saw you sleeping with his ashes and things, and would it surprise you to know that people looking at that would sort of look askance? And it makes me wonder if people have let you down in your life. Um, no, I've never been let down by people in my life. I mean, I have a great family, very, very close. Close with my was close with my mom, my dad, my sister, and even my you know cousins, aunts, uncles. Um, it was just the attachment that I had, you know, with the dog. I mean, it wasn't only me. Also, I mean, my parents were very attached to him. You know, my sister was. I mean, at the time, my husband was. It wasn't just me that you know was attached to him. I mean, he was my dog, so I had I felt that special bond with him. But it's not. It's not that I wasn't treated treated right in my life by like humans well no i just wonder you, you didn't, boyfriends and husbands didn't come until the late end of that list of people in her life i noticed but lisa what do you make of this well i do think that and i think we shouldn't minimize the love and attachment and bond that some people have with their pets i mean it really can be as intensely strong as it is with humans but i will say when that love is so strong with their pets there's often not a lot of intimacy left to develop that with humans mm. and so they don't they're not as open to meeting new people and a lot a lot of times we see this even in families of people who've lost a child. They become so obsessed with the memory of keeping that child alive that the siblings that are still alive and the husband are saying, well, what about us? We're really here in fresh and flesh and blood and we can love you. Is that incomplete, gr incomplete grieving? Is that what we're seeing? I do think I yeah. wonder if this is incomplete grief because we do say that after a pet dies, you can replace a pet or not. That's your personal choice. But we often say try a different breed, try a different gender because we don't want you to try to actually replace the pet. We're here. We're actually seeing her literally replace the pet. But I have to say double trouble is not the same as trouble. The DNA may be the same but their personalities are different because they don't have the shared experience well, that that's, Danielle that's had the question trouble. so so Danielle is a double trouble significantly different or are they very close well so far double trouble is exactly like the original trouble was from the day I got him and I took him out of his little little doggy carrying case and I put him on the floor and I was watching how he would act and interact with me he was bouncing around like trouble used to do then he started laying down with his legs extended in the back and his front paws he used to lay down and look like a seal. And then he started running underneath my bed and Trouble used to always do that, loved it. He lays on pillows like Trouble used to do. He really, really, really has the same personality. Well, let's, let's take a look at another clip from TLC special, I Cloned My Pet. When my mom had passed away, I mean, it was devastating. I felt like somebody ripped my heart out of my chest. And then when Trouble passed away, it was worse because his life was basically in my hands. I laid him on the blanket and then the vet gave him the shot to put him to sleep. It was terrible. I couldn't stop crying. I just cried and I cried for weeks. Well, Danielle, I, I must tell you that when you just told that story, that clip we just saw, uh, Lisa and I looked at each other and went, oh, there we go. Because the incomplete grief with mom and then the inconsolable grief following on the heels of that with the do dog. I mean, that's, that's avoiding grief, is it not? Well, I think, you know, we don't really get taught how to go through grief, and grief is painful. And I think oftentimes when you have one grief, it's hard enough. When you have a second one, it's even more painful. And I think that this is a way for Danielle to possibly avoid going through the grief because, you know, but it's, I think she really is going to have to at some point. Did you expect, Danielle, this is, did it almost feel as though this dog should know you when you first got him? No, well, when I first when I first opened the case and saw him, I did say, "Do you remember me?" I mean, I don't listen. I know the original dog did die, and you know the grieving process that I had, you know, with my mom passing away and the dog passing away. I grieved. It's not that I didn't grieve, and I need, still need to grieve. I mean, I understand the grieving um, process. This was just my way of, you know, wasn't I was just trying to duplicate what I already had because that's what I wanted. And, and listen, Daniel, I'm, I'm not taking issue with you doing whatever you want to do. It just, it just feels like there's a part of you, the part of you that welcomed that dog as though it were the same dog. That piece of you may not have completed the grieving process yet. That's what people do. They wall off parts.
that get left behind and they sneak out in circumstances like this, like when you meet a clone dog for the first time and expect that dog to recognize you. Now, some might consider having one's dog. I didn't think he was really going to recognize me. <laughs> uh, all right, I understand, but that part of you that ha all right, that, that, that listen, the cost for this can be as much as one hundred thousand dollars and up. So here, look at this, another tape, a piece of uh, tape from TLC, I clone my pet. I have a piece of chicken that I have in here for three years since Trouble passed away. Obviously, you can tell it's um, aged a bit. When Trouble passed away, I took his water, which is always over here, and I poured the rest of the remains of his water in here. The water really, really means a lot to me because it was the last thing that Trouble actually got to drink. His mouth was in there. That's why I actually saved it. Now, Lisa, this, this is a hard concept for people to get. I'm trying to sort of get Danielle to get her head around it, that there are parts of us, the part that would save the dog food and the dog water, that, that our conscious brain goes, I'm just, what's the big deal? But there's that part of us that is not dealing. Right. It's just the same as someone who loses a spouse and they don't take any of the clothes out of the drawer and they leave all the clothes in the closet for 10, 15 years. We know and they say, well, I just like it that way. And we know that they would have liked it that way. I mean, I think the reality, if anybody's watching this, I'm sure some people are very upset about the loss of their pet, is maybe instead of cloning a pet and spending $100,000, maybe they could foster a pet, nurse a sick dog back to health, or maybe... Um, I don't know, train a service dog for someone with disabilities, that there's ways of getting that connection back without maybe going to such an extreme. And Danielle, not taking issue. If you want to do it, right. it it's cool. It's, it. it's all cool. No judgment. You, you, yeah, really. Not being, we're not being judgmental. I, I think it's lovely that it's worked for you. And that's... Oh, no, no, no. Of course. Well, listen, I know. What I did isn't for everybody to do. This was my decision, my choice, and I know it's not for everybody out there. It takes money to clone a pet. The question is, should you do it? And next, the incredible...